So um, I'm Rob, I'm a um, senior lecturer at Leeds Arts University, but I'm also studying a part-time uh, MA by Creative Practice. So my sort of specialism and background is in product design and industrial design. And the problem I want to look at is uh, e-waste. So that's waste, electrical and electronic products. And um, this is a photograph I've taken. Um, I went to my local recycling center. This is um, the blue iron, that's my iron. Um, it didn't make it. Um, it came to the end of its life. Um, it no longer worked, it couldn't be repaired. Um, first and foremost, I couldn't actually get into it. So it has security screws that were triangular shaped. Um, I do have all those kinds of tools, so I did try and get into it and have a look around, but it is, you know, that, that relationship with that iron is, is, is over. <laughs> um, so um, it had to go uh, to the, the recycling center. Um, but what it actually did was, um, it sat in my garage, maybe, for about a few months before, you know, um, I went to that, to the, to the, to the uh, recycling centre. Um, so I think you, you might have this kind of thing yourself. You might have something that you, you don't necessarily want to throw it in the black bin. You don't want to put it in the, in the, in the bin. Um, but it has to be dealt with. It has to go somewhere. Um, so there are all these thousands of products on, you know, on, in people's garages, in people's, uh, you know, uh, back rooms, you know, waiting, you know, in that kind of like, you know, death row, ready to go to, to, the, to, the, to the next place, wherever that may be. Um, so, e-waste, e, e or um, WE, which is Waste Electrical Electronic Products, it's the fastest growing waste stream in the world. It's growing at a steady 4% year on year. Um, which is quite concerning because in the latest, latest data I could get hold of is 2018, we had around 50 million tons of e-waste produced. Um, and then as you can see of that, 38% um, of that is small equipment. So it's kind of small domestic appliances, uh, like, like I've shown you, like my iron, like the microwave oven, that kind of thing. Uh, large equipment is more uh, your your fridge, freezer, tumble dryer, that kind of thing, um, and, and so on. You can see temperature exchange uh, is equipment is, is to do with um, air conditioning. We don't have that much of a problem in this country, but globally, it's, it's a big issue. Um, and then screens and small IT and lamps. So you can see there's a, a big split there. Only 20% of all of that waste, of that 50 million tons, is actually getting documented and collected and recycled properly. Uh, the other 80% is going elsewhere and then is being traded, dumped uh, under inferior conditions. It's, it's going to other countries often um, and 4% of that is actually going in your, in, your, in your black bin, in your household waste for landfill or incineration. Um, so it's a, it's a stark picture, it's a quite a concerning picture and as I say it's growing at 4% a year so it's, it's a really... Uh, you know, it, growing and an emerging problem. Um, the other thing I'd say is that we have um, a thing called Earth Overshoot Day, which is how much of the Earth's resources we consume every year. And at the current rate, we're, we're actually consuming 1.75 Earths a year. Um, and, and that's grown as well from, from, from the early... So if you imagine an entire year, um, by the time you get to the end of July, we've used up all of our Earth's resources and the capacity of the Earth to absorb um, the, the emissions that we're, we're producing. Um, and, and that has gone from late September and it's now the middle of July. So we're actually getting worse. Uh, we're, we're consuming more um, than in the year 2000. So things are really, really uh, heading the wrong direction and um, our, our consumption is, in, is increasing. And that's, I think, to do with our throwaway culture. Um, there, is, there is a term, planned obsolescence, you may have heard of, which, is, which was actually introduced in the 1930s, or became well known in the 1930s by Bernard London's pamphlet. And his um, response to the Great Depression was to encourage um, products to be made obsolete, so you would buy something and then it would actually have a limited lifespan um, and it's a bit of a mad idea, but he was thinking along the, on the lines, lines of um, 
you know, a product would then, you know, after, after so many years become obsolete, it would be illegal to continue to own that product, you would have to replace it. Um, but that kind of thinking did pervade into the 1950s and 60s automotive industry, for example, where you could buy a new Cadillac every year. It was, you know, it was, you know, refreshed and renewed every year. Um, and that kind of um, take, make and dispose model um, became our linear economy. Uh, and this is just a diagram showing that linear economy of how a new idea is is um, put forward, it's developed, it's um, you know the tooling is made, the materials are mined and produced, and the energy is consumed to produce that product, and then it's packaged and stored and shipped around the world, um, and then it's you know put into stores and it's uh, has servicing and after sales, but really that product, that item, that domestic product is you know. After a certain point, it, you know the manufacturers do not care. It just, it just, you know, its life then continues on, um, and they they don't really have any any responsibility for it. Um, more recently, um, software has become an issue. Uh, Apple and Samsung have been fined millions of pounds uh, for deliberately slowing down their phones. Uh, through software software updates, uh, they 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 maintain that it's to um, prolong the battery life and prolong the phone, but I suspect we well they were they were they were taken to court and lost, uh, so they they actually are deliberately slowing down phones and making phones uh, harder to use and and as a consequence, uh, people renew their phones, buy new phones. And this is happening all the time. This is happening with televisions and, and speakers. Sonos, uh, the speaker manufacturer, have just been in the news recently about the way they've been uh, limiting their uh, speakers um, by bricking them. Uh, they go into a, if you want to get a 30% discount on a new speaker, uh, you push it into recycle mode. And then after 30 days, it goes it turns into a brick and it no longer plays music, it doesn't do anything, you have to return it to a, their approved recycling centre. Um, and also, if you buy a new Sonos speaker and pair it with an old Sonos speaker, uh, neither of those speakers will um, have updates. So, um, software is now being used um, to pervade this throwaway culture and this planned obsolescence. So it's really happening currently right now um, and I want to really try and challenge that kind of thinking. Um, so you may have heard of circular, a circular economy. Um, so circular design is um, what I want to look at and, and how this can be used to um, design new products, new, new devices that are actually much more sustainable. Um, so for example, uh, there are six strategies for circular product design to design products that are more uh, sustainable. Um, so designing for product attachment and, and trust, I, I'm gonna talk about that further with emotionally durable design. Uh, but that's really creating products that are, that are loved, liked, and trusted for longer. So it's something like, you know, that you actually want to keep that product for longer. Um, Designing for durability, so you know, can you develop a product that can take wear and tear without breaking down? We know we can design that. You know, we, we've got the technology to make products that are longer lasting, uh, but it's, again, it's commercial forces making things cheaper uh, and, and more disposable and more throwaway. So you know, there's no incentive to actually make the products uh, more durable. Um, so products, generally speaking, are getting uh, less durable. Um, and then we've got design for standardization and compatibility. So um, creating products with parts um, that can fit together well. Um, and we you know, can interchange with different manufacturers and things like that. Um, design for ease of maintenance and repair. Obviously, you know, can you enable it to be kept in tip top condition? Can you, you know, make that, a, could, could that be designed into like a ritual maintenance that you do with your product? Um, and then design for upgradability and adaptability is really, you know, allowing for that sort of future expansion or um, modification in the future if you want to upgrade it and change it and, and 
you know, increase that lifespan. It can kind of grow with you. Uh, and then design for dis and reassembly. So actually when it does come, like my iron, you know, when it does come to the end of its life, it is beyond repair. Um, can you ensure that things can be sorted and dis you, know, um, you know, taken apart and put into the appropriate kind of uh, sorted areas so you can put all metals together and so on? Um, so they're the kind of the, the principles that um, I'd like to kind of follow um, going forward with the research. So one thing that's really interesting is your average mobile phone um, weighs about 200 grams or thereabouts. Uh, but it actually, in actual fact, it consumes 500 kilos of the Earth's resources in, actual, in its actual production. So, and, and of that, 78 kilos is CO2 from the, the, the production and the shipping of that item. So if you think about that, that's, that's, that's like a small car or a horse or something. You know, it's a huge, a huge amount of resources that are embedded and, and, and you know, contained in, that, in the production of that mobile phone. Um, and the average lifespan of a mobile phone is 18 months. So actually, you know, I'm not saying you've got to keep your phone forever, but if you extend that lifespan to 36 months, you are halving the, co the consumption waste that's associated with the, you know, all the, the creation of that, that item. And then these are just some examples of how modular um, design has been used, durable design, design for repair and upgradability. Um, so back in 2013, there was a concept called phone blocks, and it's basically an idea for a mobile phone that's like Lego, and you can kind of customize it and, 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 and choose which items or which functionalities are most important to you. So if you want to have a really good camera, you can have a, an upgrade camera. If you want to have a bigger battery, you can have a bigger battery. Um, so it's a really interesting concept, but it's a concept. Um, that's kind of been taken further with Motorola and Google Advanced Technologies uh, and Projects Group, and they had a, 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 a concept phone called Project Ara, um, which was starting to get there. Um, really interesting kind of product architecture with the kind of uh, modular uh, chassis, as it were, and then these these um, component parts could then be swapped off, and uh, you know you could replace parts, or you could upgrade parts. Unfortunately, that's been scrapped. Um, it could maybe come back in a different form, but it is proving very technologically complicated. The nearest thing we've got to anything like that is the Fairphone, and that's the Fairphone 3. Um, but it is a phone that you are allowed to actually open up and, and repair without voiding your warranty, like you would do with, a, with an iPhone uh, or what have you. So it is, you know, there, there are some people making some steps forward, um, but I think a lot more needs to be done. Um, so this is really interesting in terms of the, you know, the repair, the upgradability, but the actual product attachment, you know, forming a bond with a product and wanting to keep it for longer is the, 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 um, the basis for emotionally durable design. So this is, um, this is a theory that's kind of been um, developed by um, Professor Jonathan Chapman. He's actually the Director of Doctoral Studies at Carnegie Mellon University, but he was previously the, the um, Professor of Sustainable Design at Brighton. And this is his um, theory, Then it can be seen in some products here. So not necessarily electronic products, um, I'll, I'll talk about the toaster in a moment, but this, this, um, this gold ring is um, it's a gold ring that's then coated in white gold. And then as you, as you live your life, um, the white gold kind of wears away and it reveals the, the, the yellow gold, the 24 karat gold underneath. And it's that kind of lived experience of as you, as you live with an item, as you kind of you know, persist with that item and keep it for a long, long time, you would keep a wedding ring for a long, long time, it actually um, you know, it improves with age. Uh, it takes on different characteristics um, and it becomes very unique to you. Um, the other, the teacup at the bottom, that's, um, that's called stain, and it's, it's a teacup that's got basically glazed and unglazed areas. And as you make your tea and, and use that cup over time, 
uh, the pattern of the glazed area and the, un the unglazed area actually becomes stained and then it reveals the, the pattern over time. So it's kind of this thing of you have to live with an item a long, long time for it to then kind of improve and change over time and improve with age. Um, this, is around, this has been around. There's, there's this, um, this small pot as well on the, on the left. This is um, the Japanese uh, art of kintsugi. Um, and you can see that it's a, it's a broken pot. It's been repaired. Uh, but it's been repaired with a lacquer that's got gold powder um, within it. So it can actually then be polished and, and um, it lends a new life to the object. But it also, you know, it's more beautiful. It's kind of more meaningful um, because it's been broken and repaired. And a lot of time and effort has gone into the repair. So it's this kind of um, idea that you can you can really live with something for a long time, um, uh, but maintain that relationship with the, with the item. Um, the Optimist Toaster by the Agency of Design, this is basically a really durable toaster that's made from cast aluminium. Uh, and it's also very easy to repair. It's very simple um, in its construction. And then one of the features it's got is it's got a little counter. So every single time you make a round of toast, it just adds another number onto the dial. So when you pass this down to your grandkids, they can see like how many rounds of toast you've had. So it's kind of got that kind of little bit of charm, that little bit of personality. Um, you know, and it, like I say, it's called the optimist. It's, it's going to live forever, you know. So it's kind of got that, um, that, that different aspect. It's not the, you know, the, the 399 Argos toaster that you're going to put in the bin. Um, so it's kind of challenging those kind of... Um, consumption trends. So further work, I mean, I'm, I am only halfway through the first year of a two-year part-time MA, so I'm trying to, at the moment, um, develop uh, surveys, interviews, um, that kind of thing. So I really am um, actually looking for participants today as well, so um, I, can, I can show that at the end. Um, but really, what I'm interested in is knowing, you know, what, what influences the significant emotional attachments in product user interactions. So when you do have an attachment to an object, um, whatever that may be, especially like an electronic product as well, because I'm interested in, the, in, in electronics and um, those kinds of products, because that's a really big problem, the e-waste problem. Um, but, you know, why do you form attachments with some things, and then why do you find it so easy to throw other things away? And what's the what's that difference? So I really want to try and drill down and find out what that is, why people form attachments, um, and then how can those insights help me, you know, design new conceptual electronic products that people want to keep for longer. So I'm trying to think of, you know, the the the, the outcomes from this this study, this this MA will be conceptual designs for new products. There'll be a range of new concepts. Um, with the aim that you can actually want to keep them for longer and repair them and upgrade them and, and live with them for a long time. Um, I also have been to, um, there's, there's a really interesting thing called the Restart Project. Um, and there's one of them in Leeds, it's called the Leeds Repair Cafe. And, and just the other, I think it was on the 15th of February, um, I went along and they, had it, they held it at the, at the market in Leeds. And um, what they did is basically com com completely run by volunteers and people can bring along an item uh, that they want to have repaired. And um, it was just really amazing speaking to the people who are bringing items to be repaired and talking to the fixers who, who repair people's stuff. Um, you know, they had all kinds of people uh, going along. Um, a lady had a, a CD player that she'd had for 20 years and um, you know it's not playing anymore. So they opened it all up inside and, and looked, and all it was was just a, a quite a long hair just tied around the laser, around the spool and around the laser. And they just pulled out the hair, screwed it all back together again, and put on the CD, and it just started playing again. And it's like, you know, she might keep that for another twenty years. And it's it's that kind of thing of how, you know, simple repairs or you know, but like I said, this is run by volunteers. They figure it out themselves, but. There is a growing repair community. Um, there are websites like iFixit uh, where you can find manuals and, and information for how to fix things. But you know, 
basic part of my recommendation, you know, concept products I might design will actually also come with a repair manual, or will come with tools, you know, it's that kind of thing of, you don't just buy it, the perfect finished product, you buy a whole way of, of maintaining it over time. Um, so that's kind of where I'm heading. And then of the emotionally durable design, um, you know, from, from Chapman, one of the most um, sort of significant papers, recent papers that have just come, come out is, is um, this was in conjunction with Philips Lighting um, and the University of Brighton. And they've come up with a kind of design framework for emotionally durable design. And it's um, lots of different strategies to employ to actually design new, design new products um, in a more sustainable way, in a more, uh, you know, holistic way. And um, there's, you know, I couldn't put this on the poster because it's just, even here it's kind of hard to see. Um, but there are several strategies. One of them that's really interesting is one called, um, here, labor, labor leads to love. Um, and that's also known as the IKEA effect. Um, and basically, um, if you've put time and effort into building something or creating a product, you've actually put your own labor into that product. And because you've put the time and effort into making it, you know, you've, you've formed a kind of connection with that product. So they're the kinds of interesting kind of strategies and, and, um, and ways forward that, that can, I can use. So really what I'm doing next is kind of evaluating these strategies and thinking of which of these strategies I can combine together. Um, but you can see there, you know, things like materiality, um, you know, m looking for sustainable materials that age really well over time, that don't scratch and look worse, that things that actually kind of like, like a leather strap on a watch or something, you know, it kind of it improves over time. Um, so like the, the, the optimist toaster that was cast from aluminium, it can, you know, cast aluminium is going to, you know, it, it can, it's not going to, even if it scratches, it's going to kind of, you know, take on a, a nice new kind of look to it. You know, it's not going to become, you know, degraded. It's going to look worn, but develop a patina. Um, so they're the kinds of things that, um, that can be used. So like I said, there's so many that I need to go far, further and investigate. And then, like I say, these concept products that I'm going to develop, um, they are going to challenge the um, sort of conventional norms of kind of consumerist um, product design manufacture. Um, so I've also been looking at sort of speculative critical design and how um, that can be used. So really, um, you can see here that you know, product design remains closely aligned with the market expectations and is one of the few areas in which conceptual and commercial approaches really do not mix. That's uh, June and Raby from Speculative Everything. And they basically say how, you know, you might be able to see really high concept stuff in fashion. You might be able to buy a really high concept piece of fashion. You might be able to see a concept car that shows a, you know, a really futuristic version of a car. But what you never really see is you don't really see very often conceptual product design, you know, domestic commercial concept products. Um, so what I, what I might produce might be quite challenging for industry or for the commercial forces, but um, it, it, that, that's why it could be quite critical um, of, of current norms. Um, this is a quite a famous um, critical piece of design. Uh, by Thomas Thwaites, it's called the Toaster Project, or a heroic attempt to build a simple electric appliance from scratch. <laughs> and what he did is he took a 399 toaster from Argos, and he said, "I'm going to recreate this toaster myself. I'm going to see if I can make a toaster from scratch." So he he, he took it apart, and he found it was made of hundreds of components, and it was infinitely complicated. But he thought, right, what are the what are the key uh, elements were the main areas. So basically, you've got copper for the pins and the electric plug and the cord and the internal wires. You've got uh, iron for the grilling apparatus and the spring to pop up the toast. You've got nickel to make the heating element. And then mica, which is kind of like a mineral that's like slate. And the mica uh, would be the heating element. And then plastic for the plug and the uh, 
the casing, you know, the sleek case, um, <laughs> which didn't quite work out. Um, yeah, so he, he went and did that, and he went and mined his own uh, ore, and he smelted his own copper and all of that stuff. And if you look, he's put it on a shelf with some toasters, uh, you know, in, in, a, in, a, you know, in just like a curries or whatever. Um, and it cost him, I think it says, like £1,187 to produce that. So it cost him over £1,000 to, to, to build that 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 working toaster. So it does work, it does toast, toast. <laughs> um, but then there's a really great quote from him and he's saying that basically he says, it seems the need to buy more stuff and save our economy, you know, like this sort of planned obsolescence idea of, you know, we need to buy more stuff to save the economy. But, but you know, this need to save, save the economy and buy more stuff balanced with, you know, to, we need to buy less to save the environment are on a collision course. So we either have to value what we've got a lot more or spend as much time and effort taking things apart and disposing of them as we do putting them together. So, yeah, it's, it's quite, um, quite a poignant thing. And like I say, you know, that is, that is just more of an uh, exhibition piece that, that's making a comment on our societal norms. But um, whatever I do next might be similar in the, in the way that it's, you know, it's a, it's a critique um, on, on design as it currently stands. Um, so what I'd like to do as well is invite you all today um, to participate in a, in, in a survey uh, that I'm doing. So I'd like to know about your emotional attachments, your um, you know, your relationships with, with, with products. Um, so it's all centered around, if you have a, um, an item, an electrical product, um, it could be anything, um, but something that is the most kind of cherished item you own. So if you've got a really, um, really cherished product that you, uh, you could never throw away, you know, it's like you could never ever get rid of it. Um, but it's an electrical product. I'd like to know about that. I'd like to know about your relationship with it and, and, and why you are attached to it. So I think that's, um, that, that would be great. So if you, if you scan that QR code with your phone, it'll give you a link to the survey. Uh, I've also got a link to the survey um, next to my poster um, in Parkinson Court if you want to talk to me about it. Um, I'd appreciate that. Um, yeah. And just to give you, and, and before everybody just says, oh, I'm attached to my phone. I mean, you can put, all put your phone if you want to, but um, I'm also looking for those kind of um, maybe more nostalgic uh, attachments, things like that. Or I don't know. I, I don't really know. That's why I'm asking. Um, so, yeah, um, I think mine is probably my, uh, my Sega Game Gear from uh, the early 90s. Uh, that's followed me everywhere. <laughs> so I um, could never get rid of that. So, uh, yeah. Um, what have you got that's, uh, that's your emotionally attached uh, electronic item? Yeah. And uh, that's, that's it, really. Yeah, there's the, the bibliography. And that's the QR code. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Rob. That was really interesting. There's lots of things to consider. Um, has anybody got any questions they'd like to ask Rob? Mm. Oh. The microphone. Yeah. It's okay, cool. Um, it's something, the question is something about uh, functionality and technology because it seems by picking electronic products you've made your job a lot harder than yes. otherwise. So that toaster, the um, Optimist toaster, probably one of the reasons they picked a toaster is it's just about the most simple machine you can have, isn't mm -hmm. it? Whereas with um, it's maybe sound stuff a little bit with Bluetooth connectivity, but phones especially, mm. to make something durable, and you've got to be either change people's expectations about what they're going to get out of it, or mm. I don't know, be able to keep up with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's where the um, the upgradability factor maybe comes into it. So you know, it could be. Um, you know, done in a in a clever way that can facilitate kind of modular parts and, and upgrades, but it is harder. It is a lot harder to do an electronic product. But the 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 problem of e-waste is such a problem, um, 
and it's something that we uh, we kind of turn away from because I think we have got this really um, quite consumerist society where we do want new things, nice new things, and um, and it's quite easy to put things on the shelf and and that's why things go in the garage or in the uh, in the shelf you know, because you don't want to throw it away straight away, and. Um, these electronic items tend to kind of gather dust before they end up in the landfill or in, you know. So there, there it is harder. I agree that it is a harder thing to try and tackle. Um, but I think um, it's something that I want to do because um, I've, I've designed this watch um, a few years ago and I didn't really understand what I was trying to do at the time. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's entirely made in the UK. Um, and it's made using sort of local uh, engineering firms. And the only thing that's not made in the UK is the Swiss mechanical movement. Um, the, the leather strap is like handmade, um, not by me, but by someone I've commissioned. Um, and I think it's quite easy to make, well not easy, but I think it's, for me to continue to do this kind of work and produce um, products that are uh, more like an heirloom or more sentimental, um, I've done, I've done it already um, with the watch, so I'm kind of thinking what's next, and um, that's kind of why I'm looking at electronics, because it's, it's such an issue, it's such a growing problem um, that I think it needs to be tackled head on, and I think, and like I say, the, 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 the products the, the, that I produce at the end of this may be quite conceptual, and they may be quite challenging, and, you know, the may it's more about kind of opening up a discussion around our our consumption trends than actually being an actual practical solution. It may be that it is a practical solution, but some of them may be more challenging than others. Um, but I do think that I've, I could make, you know, um, simpler items that are, that are easier to form connections with. And I think the challenge is, is the, the electronics because it's just, it's, it, you know, it's so easy to dispose of them. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. So um, I actually had a Fairphone before yeah. I went back to iPhone. Cool. Um, it basically just didn't work. Mm -hmm. for what I need it for. I do a lot of research with my phone. Yeah. Um, and I looked into using second-hand, so I now only buy second-hand iPhones. Mm -hmm. I then recycle them. Do mm -hmm. you think that it would be helpful, like you said, rather than making things that are that complex, just to change people's understanding and awareness of, okay, don't buy something brand new, buy something second-hand, make sure you dispose of it like in an ethical way. So uh, do you yeah. think that would be a more for those kind of really complicated things, a more sort of in-depth or better way of doing it? I think that's an excellent point. I think that's really, really valuable. And I think that y you need an item to work. You need it to function. It needs to perform. And a lot, of the, a lot of the time, you can fall out of love with a product because it doesn't perform. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Um, I'm the same. I've bought the, the Galaxy Note 9, like two years ago when it first came out. So the idea there being that if I buy the best phone I can afford, it's probably going to last me longer. But I didn't buy a fair phone. And why didn't I buy a fair phone? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, but I want it to perform. And I want it to do all the stuff I want it to do. Yeah. I feel like with so, fair phone yeah. as well, I wanted to fund them because I knew that the more you fund stuff like that, the better their technology will get because yeah. they'll have more money. But at the same time, like... It didn't perform, so I had to end up sending it back, which then affects yeah. them, them being able to make it better. But I don't know. No, no, you're right. I think we've got an obsession with being having the most advanced technology, and th this is why you know making things modular and un upgradable and repairable is is good. But it's got to be done in a, in such a way that that it's you know it, it's simple and easy to do, and and they and the performance could be the 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 best. So getting yeah. bigger companies to yeah. actually look at how they're making things rather than getting smaller companies yeah. to... And, and that's where, I suppose, that's where if I do do these conceptual products, it's more about kind of, like I said already, about creating a, a conversation or a, an awareness 
because yeah. that's all I can do. You know, I'm not going to tackle Apple <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so how do how do you do that? You know, what do you do? And it's just, it's just about doing a project and disseminating the research and, and sharing the, the the impact of it. I guess so. Yeah. That's that. So I do want to do something that's quite challenging that will hopefully get some acknowledgement or or makes some some people see that this is an issue, and. And again, it's like with anything, it's about screaming and shouting about it. And the more that we, we do that, the more impact things can, can, can have. So it's, it's going to be years. This is going to be, a, this, is a, this is my <laughs> the next 10 or 20 years of my research, I guess, to try and develop something. Um, yeah. but, but I do think that, that communication of this and, 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 and encouraging... Um, you know, refurbished uh, products and, and, and buying refurbished is a really great idea. Uh, and I could actually incorporate that into this, I think. You know, it's all part of the, the research, yeah. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah. I have a question because a lot of my friends are just, uh, well, yeah, most of our mobile phones, uh, the life cycle of our mobile phone can be only used like at a maximum for two years mm -hmm. and we really want to recycle it as just to sell, sell it back to the company or just uh, something else mm -hmm. but the issue is that if they uh, we sell it back to the apple back to any other companies they, they just give us super low price yeah, yeah that's mm -hmm. why we still think oh it's hard to do that it, it does require a a, a top-down change yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. is that is the, the the real issue here, and yeah. and for companies to change their practices is is really hard. It's you know it's glacial. You know it's really slow how how things change in that regard. So um, again, it's about kind of just creating awareness or um, you know pushing that kind of um, communication of it all. You know because um, I, I guess you know. After two years, you get a new phone, yeah, or, or whatever. You, you you know you return it, and it does. You get like a little bit of money for it, and you upgrade. But um, you know that that is the current norm, and yeah. and and what I'm saying is that, that that has to. If we if if we all push and want change, then hopefully yeah. they will listen. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking that why companies do not willing to. Uh, recycle it and for more cost is that uh, for them if they recycle it and they, then they need to remade it it will cost them more to just uh, product uh, produce a product uh, from those other materials yeah. it's really time consuming and it's really expensive to to disassemble okay. a mobile phone Ro apple have actually developed this robot that that, that dismantles phones uh, i can't remember how many it does an hour i think it does like about 200 an hour or something and it's got like suction cups that take the screen off and then it you know it <laughs> sorts all the different parts out but you know it's too expensive for humans to do that okay. you can't pay humans enough money to, to it would just be it's not economic yeah so exactly it's just not economic yeah okay. so maybe automation and, and robotics is the answer or like I say making things actually design things to be easier to dismantle from the start Oh yeah. Is is yeah. the is the easier is the, the thing that we should be doing. Yeah. Yes. Makes yeah. sense. Um, I guess yeah, as a follow on from that is that I think people also have like a lack of trust in things that aren't new. Yeah. Like, you know, people think, Oh, I don't want to buy a second hand phone because it might not work or mm -hmm. you know, what has it got any damage that's been hidden? It's kind of like I don't know, it's it's I think it's quite good maybe to start with small things, people to change, then build up to things like, because phones are such a big part of people's lives. Mm -hmm. It's just things like, you know, I mean, this is more fashion rather than environment, but like going to charity shops or using secondhand clothing mm -hmm. and then changing small things as they go because price is a big, plays a big part, doesn't it? People yeah. just, I mean, students, you know, move in, go to Wilco's, get their exactly. toasters, and it's just kind of a throwaway consumer behaviour. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, uh, going back to the first question, maybe it's, uh, I don't look, I don't try and tackle such complicated products. Maybe I try try and tackle mm. the simpler items first, um, and just and it's maybe more to do with the this idea of like making that connection and that attachment with the with the item with the product first, um, and then once that's kind of embedded, it's like 
you know you don't want to get rid of it yeah, yeah. so that's that's really the focus i think next yeah yeah thank you very much i think it's time for lunch so thank you very much for that it's no really interesting thank you.